Today, we're going to be talking about um, divergent series. You may, uh, you may have studied convergent series in Calc 2, which um, many, uh, much of that material is spent um, going over trying to figure out whether something is convergent, because if it's convergent, we can assign a value to it. And you just kind of cast aside the divergent series because um, they, they go to infinity. But that doesn't mean that we can't try to at least assign them with a value whether or not that's actually equal to the sum of all of them together. So we're going to keep a very open mind here because none of these numbers, act, none of these series that we have actually sum up. Like if you were to take all of them from the beginning to the end, sum up to the number that we're going to assign to it, but they do have properties that are similar to that number, and as such, we're going to compare it to those numbers. And we're going to start by, a, um, by establishing a concept of omega, which we're going to define as being the length of an infinite series. Um, and after that, we're going to use omega to uh, establish a set of rules to um, infinite sequences, and also uh, look at a few examples um, of uh, other people who are much more intelligent than me uh, assigning values to infinite series and seeing how those fit inside our system. And uh, we're going to start by looking into the idea of infinity. And infinity means, like Christmas, means a lot of things to a lot of people. It's, uh, uh, for, for instance, with a child, you could try explaining it as being one greater than the largest number you can think of which works to some extent. It's nev you're never going to reach it. That's one of the points of infinity. But uh, it's not perfect. Um, and other questions on infinity are those such as, uh, is, there an, is there a wall at infinity? Uh, if we had an infinitely long pole, if we had a pole and we said it was infinitely long, um, would we be able to push it further? Or would we only be able to pull it? Because if it reaches infinity, could we push it past infinity? Um, and also, uh, there, there are even people who don't believe that infinity exists as a concept, um, particularly during the 1800s uh, when set theory was just start, starting to be formed. Uh, people such as Leopold Kronecker said, There's, infinity is nonsense. And, he, and to some extent, it is true. There, there really is no good example of infinity in our world, uh, in our physical universe. But and, uh, Abraham Robinson created uh, a way of looking at infinity, and he called it the hyperreal system. What the hyperreal system is, is uh, an extension of the real numbers such that um, such that it includes numbers that are both infinitely small and infinitely large. So you have, for instance, we're going to call it epsilon. That's our infinitesimal. That in, uh, it's infinitesimal if it is less than any real number. If it's, or it's, an, it's an infinitesimal if it's greater than 0 but less than any positive real number. Um, and then we also include the inverses of uh, these numbers, which is um, uh, the infinitely great numbers, uh, the reciprocals, I should say. And we're going to draw a timeline just to show uh, what it is. And there are, we really end up having to draw uh, two different timelines because um, with, with uh, the infinitely large um, uh, numbers in the hyperreal system, we uh, with the infinitely large numbers in the hyperreal system, we can't draw them on the same timeline as the real numbers. Because if we were to draw them on the same timeline as the real numbers, we would, uh, we would, it would, they would be, they'd all be placed on zero. Um, for in, and yeah, they'd work as the. Hyperreal numbers work as an extension of, of the uh, real number system. And as such, um, 
and here I'll draw an example of what I was talking about. Um, if we drew the number line between 0 and the reciprocal of epsilon, um, you would see that uh, if we were to take a point here, this would be half of epsilon, which is still infinite. And then if we pick this uh, point in between, halfway in between that, we would get a quarter of epsilon. And if we were to just keep getting smaller and smaller, you'd realize that every point except for the point at 0 is infinitely large. So all of, right here, we actually have all of the real numbers. The real numbers exist in basically what ends up, what amounts to a single point when compared to these infinitely large numbers. And that's important to note uh, for later on. I'm going to finish up this uh, number line. And, but also, uh, it's important to note the uh, definition of a monad. And a monad is, relates to the infinitesimals, um, which it's basically um, if we had this point 0, or basically what a monad is, is it is every, it is the set of all numbers that are infinitely close to a given number. And that, that is to say, um, it would be, if we were to write out the set of all numbers that are infinitely close to a number, we would write it as, um, we could write it as um, r, the monad of r would be r um, minus 2 epsilon and r minus epsilon and r, and then r plus epsilon and on. And um, for the, and basically it's just saying, all, and we would say all of the numbers contained within the monad of R are infinitely close to each other and are approximately equal to each other. Um, and that's going to be important to note later on. Uh, moving on, we're going to look at um, another example of someone trying to take on the problem of infinity, uh, which was Hilbert's Hotel, um, created by David Hilbert, a very intelligent uh, mathematician in the 1800s. Uh, Hilbert's Hotel is um, basically, the idea is, is if we have an infinitely large hotel, then we would uh, we create that hotel and number each of the rooms um, move going on, and each room has a number. And let's say that um, it's Christmas night, and uh, a lot of people are in town, we end up booking the entire hotel. Uh, let's set aside the fact that there are, infinite pe there are an infinite number of people, and we'll just give them each a letter to represent them. Now let's say someone else were to come to our hotel uh, in the middle of the night and say they wanted a room, even though we said no vacancies. We could still find them a room, because if we have our guy right there, um, what we could do is we could take guest A and move him outside of his room in the middle of the night, nonetheless, and move in our other guest. But now A doesn't have a room. So what we're going to do is move B out of his room and move A into his room, which conveniently has a, a nice gift basket for him uh, <laughs> due to being moved out in the middle of the night. and. By, and now B needs a room, so we put him in, in, the, in the third room and move C out. And what we can do is we can just keep doing this until everyone has a room, um, which doesn't make sense logically. Because when you think about it, if you have, if you think about it, what we're really doing is if we said the hotel was, uh, had S rooms in it, then we could say, um, ultimately, we had, um, ultimately, by moving in the uh, extra guest, we would have, it would be, in, in assuming that it's the same size afterwards, it, we could say that its size is S and S1, which, doesn't make, which uh, as I said before, it doesn't make sense. Uh, 
if you will, take for example um, uh, a boy who, um, a, a young boy sleeping in his bed. Uh, this is his blanket, and we're going to draw him. But there's a problem. He's not actually very happy because he's not actually happy. He's quite sad because his feet are cold because his blanket is too short. All right, that's still happy. <laughs> but so he is um, sad because his blanket is cold. So in the morning, he goes to his mom and presents the problem to her. So she has the brilliant idea of, well, we could cut the top part of the blanket off and put it down here. That way, his feet won't be cold. And so they do that. And of course, when he pulls up the blanket, it, his feet are uncovered again. So we're left with the same problem. And that's how numbers generally work, is that you can't create more where there wasn't any before. And so ultimately, the solution was to wear boots. He just had to add another layer to his uh, covering. And we're actually going to use this idea. We're actually going to use the idea that um, of uh, that um, of Hilbert's hotel, and we're going to call it Omega now. And what we're going to say is that um, Omega is equal to Omega plus one, which um, is when we're also going to say it's the length of any sequence. You can also see how it would be a hyperreal number as if you had. Uh, um, uh, because a hyperreal number is just anything greater than um, anything greater than any real number. So if we had a real number r that was equal to omega, then we could say omega is equal to omega plus one, and omega plus one is greater than r. So what we're going to do with omega is we're going to uh, see what we see uh, what kind of properties we can pull out of it. So first off, we're going to say uh, since omega is equal to omega plus 1, we could also say omega is equal to 1 plus omega plus 1. And so then omega is equal to 2 plus omega. And if you were to continue this, we could see that really omega is equal to omega plus any integer c. So we could ultimately say it was equal to 2, 3, 4. We can make it equal to Graham's number. We can make it equal to anything any integer. Uh, we also, and as we said, it was going to be the inf it's the length of an infinite sequence. Uh, we also note that the difference between omega and itself is c by subtracting omega from, from both sides. We don't want to uh, subtract through this because it's equal to c. Um, and c is an indeterminate integer. And what that basically means is that it can be anything. Um, so when we subtract omega from omega, we have to keep in mind that we don't know what the difference between omega and omega is going to be. We know that it's going to be an integer, but we don't know that it's going to be, uh, we, don't, we don't have a set value for that. It's not equal to 0. We do note that uh, if, um, although, the uh, idea of a number minus itself is equal to 0 doesn't work with omega. Um, multiplying by omega, like saying n times omega, is still consistent. Um, and moving on, we're going to uh, use this idea of omega is equal to omega plus c to create a sort of hyperreal system of omega. So if, if you will, um, um, we're going to say omega to the n is equal to the omega to the n plus c times omega to the n minus 1, which basically, which if you, if you remember back there, we have our number line uh, going from uh, 0 to 1 over epsilon. We're going to draw that again. And so the number line between 0, or uh, between, yes, between 0 and omega, um, if we were to draw this number line, we would note that the real numbers are still here because omega is an infinitely large number. Now if we were to draw um, the number line between 0 and omega squared, and we, we uh, did our little thing where we uh, get smaller and smaller, we note that not only does this 
does, is the real numbers in this point, are the real numbers in this point, but also omega is in this point um, because it's uh, infinitely smaller than omega squared. Um, and if we were to do that for omega cubed, same, the same thing would happen. We'd find that at zero would be everything, would be uh, the real numbers and omega and omega, key, uh, omega squared. And so basically what we, and so what we end up with is we end up with sort of a stair-stepping um, system of omegas in which each one is infinitely greater than the previous. Uh, and as such, we can apply that property that um, uh, omega to the n is equal to omega to the n plus c times omega to the n minus 1. And moving from there, we're actually going to use that to create a sort of infinitesimal error. And if you think about it in terms of standard analysis, uh, where we have our errors, they work the same basic way in that we know that um, we know that this number has to be, we know that this number can uh, be somewhat, can be infinite, if we have, we can add infinitely small numbers to this number and without changing it. And if you remember the definition of the monad, um, if we say that the monad of a number is uh, infinitely, if we, if we, with the monad, we said they were approximately equal to each other. With this, we're saying that all numbers contained within the monads are equal to each other, that there is no difference between them. Uh, and as such, e they're indistinguishable, eh, indistinguishable from each other, which uh, is where the indeterminate c comes in. Because if we write that down, r is equal to, r is equal to r plus or minus uh, uh, C, um, in which this is an infinitesimal, um, we end up with, uh, it could be, we're basically just saying that it could be anywhere between R plus C, R plus any integer, and R minus any integer. And from there, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the most important thing for, about omega. From there, we're going to uh, use omega to define a set of properties which we can um, use, um, use to uh, manipulate infinite series. And this is where it starts getting fun. This is actually where I started and moved back, to regress to where I, I've been. But this is, um, uh, we're basically just going to define a set of um, rules that we can use in order to, um, to manipulate infinite series. So starting out, we have the shift rule. That's basically just saying if we have, um, if we have uh, infinite series um, s sub 0 plus s sub 1 plus s sub 2 and on, and we say that's an in, when we say it's infinitely long, then we would say the series with one less term, s sub zero plus s sub one plus s sub two, and I'm putting the uh, infinite series inside of a bracket to emphasize that it's uh, an infinite series. Um, it shows that uh, this is also an infinite series, um, despite the fact that it's one shorter than this, which we can see through omega as omega is equal to omega plus one. We can also change the infinite sequence uh, length by uh, an arbitrary integer. So we could also bring out s1 or s2. We could bring, you can basically bring out as many terms as you want, as long as it's finite. Um, but yeah, moving uh, onto the uh, distributed property, which is which most of you already know, if you multiply, uh, if you multiply uh, basically a scalar or a, a real number, r, um, you get, uh, you can multiply by all of the terms. And we're going to actually give an example of that in a second, but it's, 
important to note that this is true um, because the uh, if this wasn't true, we could say omega is equal to um, any n number of things. Uh, we also have the addition property, which I'll get to in a second, um, which basically just allows us to add, uh, add infinite sequences together. And this is by far the most important rule, because all the other rules just allow us to take one sequence and um, change it in some way. The addition property, on the other hand, uh, allows us to say, um, allows us to take two sequences and put them together into one sequence, which is um, extremely important um, because uh, extremely important because it allows us uh, almost infinitely more possibilities. And you may take note that I'm using uh, I'm using parentheses to. Uh, group off the terms, and that's because we want to preserve the idea that omega is the length of an infinite sequence. Uh, and so we're just, we, uh, we want to emphasize that um, we're matching up the terms of the infinite sequences, as you can see up there, um, so that th it remains the same length. Like if you, let's say, uh, for instance, you took S sub 0 and added t sub 0, and then you just did every other term, then you'd have something that was twice omega, which wouldn't be uh, an infinite sequence anymore. It'd be something else. But um, we're, we're going to use this property to uh, create a new property, which is uh, the multiplication property. And the multiplication property is um, in, is uh, instead of uh, just writing down the uh, instead of just writing down the definition of multiplication property, as you can see on your screen, uh, we're gonna take an example, and we're gonna and we are going to use uh, two is equal to one plus one half plus one fourth, and on. And we're going to use 1 is equal to 1 half and 1 fourth and 1 eighth and on. And if we were to multiply these together, we're going to first we're going to take a, use the distributive property. We're going to say 2 times 1 is equal to um, 2 times 1 half plus 2 times uh, 1 fourth plus 2 times 1 eighth and on and on. And we're actually going to shift it. Oh, we're going to take this and shift it down to here. So then we get uh, 2 times 1 is equal to 2 times 1 half and, uh, plus 2 times a fourth and on. And from there, um, we're going to expand it out this way. So now we have um, 1 times 1 half plus uh, one half times one half plus a half plus a fourth times a half. And we're going to do that with each of these terms um, moving down the line. Um, and, and, and we're going to add them up in order uh, once we get to the end, man. Talking and writing at the same time is not as easy as I thought it was. <laughs> Just have to say. All right. And from here, we are, we are going to, uh, we're just going to go down the columns and add them all up. Uh, and we're going to try that first. And we're going to quickly see that that's probably not going to work. Uh, and the reason why we don't like this is because um, if we were to just add them up going down, um, then what we'd end up with is just a, uh, 
we'd end up with another infinite series. We'd end up with an infinite series of infinite series, which is a nightmare to calculate, let me tell you. Uh, it's not fun. So we're going to change it. We're, uh, we remember we have the shift rule um, right there we can use. Um, so instead of just giving, uh, giving up and give, having our infinite series of infinite series, we're going to shift all of the terms below the first one over one. So what we're going to do is put, and we're going to, we basically are just taking it all and shifting it over. So this is what we get. And now we can at least have a term for here. So now we have uh, 2 times 1 is equal to 1 times 1 half and plus whatever this ends up being. And then we find ourselves in the same problem. So we're going to shift it over again. Uh, we're going to shift everything below the second term uh, over 1. So we get rid of this and change this to a 1. And now we have, uh, now we have a fourth plus a fourth is equal to uh, one half or two fourths. And then if we were to do that again, we'd shift over this again and we'd end up with three eighths. And ultimately, if you were to plug this into your calculator, we end up getting two times one is equal to uh, one half plus two fourths plus three eighths plus uh, four sixteenths. And you can kind of see the pattern. If you were to plug that into your calculator, uh, you would find that it would approach 2. And so that's kind of just demonstrating how we could multiply infinite sequences together. So uh, and now we're going to get to the part where we look into examples, um, which we're <laughs> sorry to make you guys turn your uh, necks, but uh, it's a uh, we're going to look at this, um, the, the sequence created by um, Ernesto Cesaro in 1890. Um, and you, if you, you might just want to ignore that definition unless you uh, understand it right, and unless you understand it immediately, because uh, we're just going to be looking at the example of um, 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1. That's one, that's one. And this is our first uh, divergent series that we're going to be evaluating. So uh, this is pretty big. Uh, let's look at, um, so your first instinct may be to take, um, and we're going to call this S for simplicity's sake. Your first instinct may to be to say, all right, well, we have um, positive and negative terms right next to each other. Let's just move those negative terms over to the positive terms. And so let's see what happens when we do that. We're going to add, um, first we're going to take, we're going to add um, wherever we have a negative term. Um, and, we're, and if you look, we're only doing every other term. So we could say that's uh, omega over 2, because it's, it has half as many terms as it's as the length of it for the sequence. So what we get is we get uh, s plus omega over 2 is equal to 1 plus 0 plus 1 plus 0. It's 1 plus 0. And, um, and now we're just going to subtract that term back out. So we'll do uh, s plus omega over 2 minus omega over 2. Uh, and what we get is, um, and we're just going to go every other again. And what we end up getting is, is, a, is a sequence of zeros. And so it looks like we have our answer. We have s plus omega over 2 minus omega over 2 is equal to 0. Well, we're going to write that down. But if you remember earlier, we have the idea that omega minus omega is equal to an indeterminate integer. And so if we were to move this around, we get s is, s is equal to, uh, or s is equal to 0. s is equal to uh, omega minus omega over 2 
s is equal to c over 2, um, we find that that didn't work. We, uh, we ended up with an indeterminate form for our answer, and as such, we can't draw any conclusions from it. We basically reached a dead end. We uh, used too many. Because we added and subtracted infinite quantities from each other, we, we can't find ourselves a finite answer. So instead, uh, let's look at it. Um, let's use some of the rules that we created, uh, such as the which one is it? shift rule. There it is. And we're going to make sure we note that this is the infinite sequence right here. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the 1 out. And we're going to say s is equal to 1 plus negative uh, 1 plus 1 minus 1 plus dot, 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 dot. And we might notice that if we multiply the scale, if we multiply negative 1 into this infinite sequence, um, which we're going to do, we're going to say s is equal to 1 plus negative 1 times 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 plus dot, dot, dot. We have s again. So we can say s is equal to 1 minus s. And so adding s back over, we end up with 2s is equal to 1, and s is equal to 1 half. And so we have successfully assigned uh, a real value to this infinite sequence that never really diverges to anything. So that's pretty cool. I, I think it's pretty cool. I love this stuff. Uh, moving on to the Ramanujan summation, which is uh, even more complicated, we uh, basically end up with, uh, we're going to take our old buddy S, and we're going to call him S1 now, because we have more S's. Uh, and we're going to start by uh, giving S2, which we're going to say S2 is equal to 1 minus 2 plus 3 minus 4, and on. And we're going to subtract S1, or we're going to add S1. S1 is equal to 1 minus 1. And we're going to use him to give, we're going to use the 2 to uh, give us a value for S2 is equal to plus 2 minus 3 plus that, that, that. And what we, f we can multiply, and as you saw before, we could uh, we're going to multiply in the negative here and make this S2 plus S1 is equal to 1 plus S2, um, or minus S2, minus S2. And this is going to be, um, and so then we're going to add S2 back. It's S2 plus 1 half is equal to 1 minus S2. Um, and we have 2S2 is equal to 1 half. And then we get S2 is equal to 1 fourth. So then from here, uh, we're going to move on to uh, seeing if we can give uh, 1 plus 2. And this is, this is the proof that uh, Ramanujan gave. And actually, before, this is the, uh, just the layman's justification of the proof that uh, Ramanujan gave for why 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 is equal to negative 1 over 12. Um, but not, as not to shortchange him, he also used that formula to derive his results. So we're going to take, we're, we're going to, he had more justification than just what I'm showing you right now. So we're going to go back to that. Um, and we're going to say S3 is equal to 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5, and attempt to give that a value. Um, and uh, the idea that we're going to use is we're going to say, all right, well, if we do every other term, and just to show you what uh, Ramanujan did, he subtracted, he did negative uh, 4 times S3. And uh, what you end up getting 
is you end up getting negative uh, 3 s3 is equal to 1 minus 2 plus 3 minus 4 plus 5 and on. And we notice that's s s2. So we say negative 3 s3 is equal to 1 fourth. Uh, and S3 is equal to negative 1 12th, which seems great until you notice that up here we went every other term. So this isn't an infinite series. It's actually half of an infinite series. If we really wanted to make it, um, and we're going to say, uh, and we're going to say, if we say this is equal to S3, we're, we're going to say, uh, we would, if we wanted to make it an infinite series, we would have to add a zero every so often. And if we were to add a zero every so often, um, what that would do is it would change its value. Um, so we're going to take the, we're going to take this, uh, S, we're going to call it S4. S4 is equal to 1 plus 0 plus 2 plus 0 plus dot, dot, dot. And we're going to see if we can make this into S3 because S4 looks, pre looks pretty much like S3. It's very similar. So we're going to start by saying, we're going to start by writing out S3, and this is a little trick that you can do when adding up into, when figuring, when dividing infinite sequences. Is we're going to say, all right, uh, S3 is equal to, um, and we're going to start with 1s4 because there's 1, 1 to 1. So we get 1 plus 0, 2, 0, 3, 0, and on. And then we're going to move over and see if we can make this term, e if we can make a term equal to 2. So we're going to say plus 2s4. And so then we get 2, 4, and 6. And we've got to add our zeros in there because we can't forget those. Remanusian did, and look where it got him. Uh, and finally, we use one more uh, S4 to get us one, uh, to get us to where we want to go. Because if you look, now that we have one, two, one, that's four. S4 is equal to one plus two plus three plus four plus five plus six, and on. And so what we say is 4s4 is equal to 3s3. And while, and if we bring this back up, we bring our thing back up, we say, see that this is actually equal to uh, 4s4, we would see that um, if we were to multiply that in, s3 is equal, we would actually say, uh, we would actually change this to say S3 uh, minus S4 minus 4S4 is equal to. And um, so what we would have said up here if by changing it is that uh, S3 minus 4S4 is equal to um, S2. And if we substitute back in 4s4, we find that s3 minus s, s3 minus s3 is equal to s2. And if you want to actually know what the value of 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 is, uh, you can just multiply omega by itself, actually. Because what you'd find is that if we multiply omega by itself, then we get a triangle, and we ultimately end up with um, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, and on. And so that's, uh, th according to our system at least, there are other, res um, to be clear, I'm not the only, I'm not the first person to have tried to assign values to divergent series. Uh, there, actually, um, there are applications in physics in particular, and especially evolving, revolving around the idea that 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 is equal to negative 1 over 12, is greatly beneficial in quantum mechanics. 
but the according to our system that we created, which um, is fairly consistent, uh, we we say that's equal to omega squared. And uh, that's the end of my presentation. Oh, it's short on time. Are there uh, any questions? Yes? Yeah, uh, first response to the question you was that you kind of explained that the spending amount of time that it took to fix through the lab was to play with speeds to try to like stumble through the HCM. Um, but uh, I guess my question is um, it seems like you, when you start to evaluate students at the end of the class, uh, you know, you can get a few fine tweaks, divergent, integrogen, and something like this. Seems like once you kind of enter into this realm of infinity, everything is just always equal to infinity. So like, can you explain to me like, um, I guess, how is this not just like? It almost feels like we're kind of like making things up. You know, I want to like boo it out of the room here, but you know, like it feels like uh, at a point where it's kind of like robbing around saying, "Hey, this is a scientific instrument, or this is this." You know, I guess well, like, what are we really interpreting? Okay, so I, I did, I think I mentioned earlier that uh, we're, we're not uh, treating them, we don't treat, we're not going to treat the divergent series like they add up to the number that we're saying they are. Uh, and that's important to note, we're, we're actually just saying they have similar properties to the, uh, like for, in the, uh, we're saying they have similar properties to the numbers that we're assigning them. In the instance of uh, 1 half is equal to uh, 1 minus 1 plus 1. I got lucky. Normally, when you just draw a marker like that, you, uh, it's awful. But uh, if you notice, if we were to, um, if you were to just play around with this a bit, you could add, uh, one, if you subtracted 1 from both sides, you get 1 half minus 1 is equal to, uh, and we'll get rid of that one, so then we get uh, this, we get the negative the, uh, 1 plus 1 minus 1, and then we have negative 1 half is equal to, and we actually notice this is the uh, negative, if we multiply this by negative 1 again, we get uh, negative 1 times 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1, and on, and so we end up with negative 1 half is equal to negative 1 half again. And if you play around with it a bunch, it actually stays the same. So we're more so making divergent series out to be similar to real numbers. We're, we're kind of saying, hey, they're not that big and bad. Like, you don't have to be afraid of them. They're kind of just like us, you know? Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is if we wanted a certain answer, we could make that be true, sort of? I guess that's the way like, it feels to me. That was kind of, and that was, that's kind of what I thought when I first started uh, exploring these, was that if we just let, like, for instance, one of the first things I learned about infinite series was that uh, you can't skip every other with that rule. Um, actually, the, uh, the Ramanujan sequence, and I keep pointing it, but you keep, uh, I'll go back to that on the slideshow, um, right here where he just uh, skips over and makes it half the sequences. That was the first thing that I kind of figured out was wrong about it, was that you have to have the same length. And that actually keeps it consistent. If we were to go by those rules, we can basically make whatever. We, we could make it equal to anything. So yeah, there, 
and at, if you uh, notice the uh, the properties, they all they actually work for any uh, any sequence, convergent or divergent. The shift rule, the distributive, those are all based on properties that work with convergent series. Um, so it. And, in a, and to, answer your, and to uh, answer your question, I guess, uh, it is very consistent. Like, if you follow these rules, you won't, if you follow these rules and have a good general idea of what omega is, then you won't actually end up with, like, 0 is equal to 1. It, so. Negative one, yeah. and if you were to s in, in uh, one, it one over one minus the common ratio tells you the sum of all the counting numbers is greater than one. Now, if we if Logan is not claiming that we're summing those to get negative one, but he is claiming that you can assign the value of negative one, and that, that's exactly what Euler did. And there are people who look at that and say, "Well, he's an idiot. Well, he's not an idiot." <laughs> Rank, he was simply pointing out, as Logan pointed out, that you can assign values. And in a sense, there is a certain, I, I hate to use the word arbitrary because it's not arbitrary, but there is a certain freedom to have these things sum up to unexpected quantities that you assign these values. And to, to build on what you were saying, if you want to look at it using our system, we could say uh, 1 plus, uh, in, if we notice, if we divide 2 out, we get 2 times 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 8 plus dot, dot, dot. And we're going to assign this uh, value t. And so we say t is equal to this. So t is equal to 1 plus 2t. And move t over, we get negative t is equal to 1, and t is equal to negative 1. Mm-hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Use the mechanism to go next week. See how that works. Hi, Logan. I was also curious about uh, uh, since there was a gap there, and you haven't written enough to die. Yeah. That would be a very nice two false question to say: Does this uh, infinite series sum to a half? And an unsuspecting student would find the common ratio is minus one and use the same formula and say, yes, it does, and then forget that the radius of convergence doesn't include minus one. So I'm curious that our method we've developed here is uh, coming to the very thing that's okay. in the student's own mind. So I am I'm curious to know about that. Right? I guess um, if, we, if we wanted to be technical, we should have, for every equal sign on this board, and I'm not going to go through and do it, but we should uh, have written it like this, because um, it's not actually equal to. We're just, yeah, we're just defining it as um, the, uh, 
that it, it's not equal to it. We just say that it's similar enough to it that we can use it in a certain way which it stays consistent, I guess. So no, 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 is not equal to uh, 0 or a, half. Or, or a half or 1. It's not equal to anything. But we can say it's very similar to 1 half. Yes? So is 1 half, under, under this condition, is 1 half the only number that we can assign to the system? Using our system, yes, unless I'm mistaken. But I haven't encountered anything that would suggest otherwise. No, if we follow the if we follow our basic rules, we wouldn't. Anything else? What about the H? Number file. Uh, if you've ever seen, if any of you have seen Number File, uh, there's a video um, explaining Ramanujan's uh, sequence that. Uh, shows that, uh, and, it, and it presents it, and it presents uh, as if 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus dot, dot, dot is equal to negative 1 over 12. And so I saw that video, and I thought, there's no way. That can't be. It can't work that way. And I was right, mind you. <laughs> but I was right in a different way than I had thought I was previously right. <laughs> but yeah, it's, and so I kind of stumbled upon this, because a lot of people will tell you it's ridiculous to say that uh, 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 is equal to 1 half. And they're right. But there's some, and, and to some extent, most of, the, uh, most of the evaluating divergent series involves using things like Riemann zeta function and uh, other really incredibly complex functions. But no one was really, no one really wanted to talk ab about uh, using a sort of arithmetic style approach to infinite se series. And I kind of saw that and I thought, and I noticed that it really works well. And I kind of put together this system based on the idea that it's easy to understand, easy enough to understand, that you can, you don't have to uh, have uh, a prior knowledge of the Bernoulli function in order to work with it. Yes? Is this what you want to kind of study at U of M? Is this like? Well, I mean, there's a, there are a lot of things to study at U of M. Um, I thank you for, for your concerns, my sister Trisha. Uh, <laughs> but. But it's just, it's one of the many things I hope to study at Michigan. Yes. You mentioned about the fifth rule being finite number of times. Why can it be infinite number of times? Um, all right. There's an answer to this question. I can't think it's uh it has to do with the fact that if you add something uh bring something ugh. there's a different way of of explaining the infinitesimal error rule um which involves instead of thinking about things as having smaller numbers uh thinking about each uh equation as having a finite number of energy required to do it or an infinitesimal amount of energy. So, if you use up too, if you use up an infinite amount of energy, you get errors. It just stops working. And it's kind of that idea is that if you add something with a one minus one plus one minus one, there is an alternate explanation of that where you, if you look at how one minus one plus, if you were to look at it from the error standpoint, which I didn't spend a whole lot of time on, uh, you would end up with um, from term to term, at least. 
you, if you were to graph it, you would end up with, uh, you're to look at how the, the, uh, the value, the, the R goes, it goes up and down and up and down. And it doesn't really go anywhere. It just kind of goes up one, then down one, then up one, then down one. It doesn't leave, it doesn't go into, but if you look at how the error goes, if you look at how the error goes, it just keeps going up because addition or subtraction, the error is going to increase. And if you do it an infinite number of, and if you add an infinite number of infinitesimals together, as we know from uh, integrals, you end up with a finite number. And that's kind of the idea is that if you take an infinite number of terms out of the thing, it'll, it'll cause problems. That's just the most, I guess that's basically what I'm trying, what I'm getting at. If that answers your question at all. Okay. And doing an infinite amount of anything generally isn't a good idea. I mean, no, that's a, yeah. Mm -hmm. have you, so you're working with the infinite Have you done anything with the different levels of infinity to some infinities are bigger than others? Well, the interesting, um, yes, there are, uh, for instance, uh, we have our system of omegas. Um, actually, to, sorry, to answer your question, yes, I have. And the interesting thing about this system of omega is that it kind of wraps back around onto itself, like it goes if you, um, for instance, if you were to take uh, each of the powers of omega and you were to say uh, omega omega plus omega squared plus omega to the third and on, and add that all up, you would get, actually you'd get this right here, you'd get t. Because actually, if you want to be technical, each of the powers of omega is equal to a column of Pascal's triangle. So going down, you see you have 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1. That's omega. And then you have 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4. That's omega squared. And on and on. And so you can, if, if you look at how these line up, and then you remember that if you go across the rows of Pascal's triangle, um, you get. Um, 2 to the n, and as such, you get 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 8 plus 16, which is t, and you get negative 1. So, yeah. Looks like we're about out of time. Are there any? Anything else? Yeah?